Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Vertical Rotors and How to Achieve Higher Purity and Yield Viral Vectors with Greater Efficiency. I am Megan Pascal of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. To learn more, visit Beckman.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Sean Sternisha, PhD, Senior Field Application Scientist at Beckman Coulter. Sean, you may now begin your presentation. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thanks everyone for joining. I'm really happy to uh, present this educational webinar to you where I will discuss vertical rotors and some of the advantages that they have. So this slide is just uh, some legal notices, including regulatory and trademark statements that were required to share, as well as intellectual property statements. Uh, and here's a, a general agenda for our talk today. Uh, so I'll start by going over the different types of density gradients and, and why density gradients are used. And then from there, I'll, I'll discuss some of the current state and what most of our, our customers are doing nowadays as well as a look towards future state and how you might be able to optimize your workflow. And then from there, I'll transition into some case studies uh, showing vertical rotors and some of the benefits they have in very specific cases, as well as some of the key conclusions and uh, additional opportunities to optimize your workflow. So with that, I can, I can jump into it. Um, this slide here is uh, meant to be pretty high level. Um, it's, it's really showing what density gradients are used for, and you can tell that it's a, a, a pretty broad range here. Uh, at the highest of levels, density gradients are chosen for difficult separations that require very high purity and high yield. There's a lot of applications within life science research where um, density gradients are used. Uh, there on the left, you can see uh, viruses. And so here I'm thinking kind of viral vectors and things like that, where uh, there's often an inefficiency in terms of packaging of that nucleic acid cargo uh, within the, the capsid itself. And so you end up with a, a diverse population ranging from empty, partial, and full capsids. This is one of the biggest use cases of uh, density gradients nowadays. And in that, that actual image there, you can see a discrete separation between uh, each of those species. Uh, there in, in the light blue too, you can see extracellular vesicles. Um, this is another really great example of um, the power of density gradients, really. Um, a lot of people tend to purify these using um, pelleting. That can be a great method as well. It really depends on what your output is. But what density gradients allow you to do is to separate these on, uh, on the basis of their, their density, which I'll, I'll talk quite a bit more about. But you can really start to fractionate out some of these distinct subpopulations of extracellular vesicles. Uh, and then finally, in the light green, you can see some proteins there. This is another really common use case uh, for density gradients where you have, you've got a, a protein complex that you're trying to separate out uh, from, from other contaminating proteins. Uh, and, and I'll talk about rate zonal separations, which is primarily what that's using. Uh, but you can really get a nice fractionation of these using density gradients. So really, when you're looking for purity and yield and the separation is relatively difficult in terms of you know, the, the sample of interest being different from what you're trying to, to remove, uh, density gradients are a really great option here. Okay, so uh, density gradients uh, come in a lot of different variations. Uh, the first one I'll talk about here is isopicnic. Uh, and so these are density gradients where you're trying to um, separate out materials on the basis of their buoyant density. Uh, and so typically you'll use a self-forming gradient in this case. Uh, but really what you're looking for in an isopicnic gradient is a linear or continuous gradient at the end. Um, cesium chloride is probably the best example of this. 
And these gradients are really used when you're looking for the highest possible purity. Um, really, when you have that continue, continuous or linear gradient, you're going to get the best uh, differentiation between different densities. And then that, that plot uh, graphic that you can see there at the bottom um, illustrates kind of a, a typical approach for this, where in the before picture, you, you start with generally a uniform concentration of your sample as well as your density forming material. And then after you throw it in the centrifuge, you end up with that, that linear gradient that I've been mentioning, as well as a distinct separation between your uh, bands of interest. Similar to that is equilibrium zonal. Uh, it's a very similar technique to isopicnic, except in this case, what you're doing is, is often starting with a, uh, a preformed type of gradient. So it's not necessarily continuous, but you've got defined steps along the way. The output of this, or the goal of this rather, is to separate again on the basis of buoyant density. However, in this case, because you're not actually forming a linear gradient, the resolution is often a little bit a little bit lower than what you'd see with isopicnic. Uh, on on the the flip side to that, though, you can often achieve these separations quite a bit quicker. Uh, and so the the illustration there at the bottom again is showing you that instead of form, starting with a uniform concentration of gradient. Uh, material as well as sample. Now you've got distinct layers of your density forming material and your sample there on top. You get similar separation, but the resolution tends to be a bit lower. Uh, as I mentioned, you can achieve this quicker. Uh, so for something like AAV or adeno associated virus, uh, this tends to be a pretty popular option because it's a good balance between resolution and uh, throughput or time. And the last example I'll share here is uh, rate zonal. And this one tends to be the most different compared to the other two. Uh, this is when you want to separate materials on the basis of size and mass. Uh, in other words, on sedimentation coefficient. Uh, and in these experiments, again, you're using more of a preformed gradient. Uh, it's similar to isopicnic in the sense that you're using a continuous or linear gradient for it. But the uh, actual process itself, once it's in the centrifuge, is quite different. Uh, so here, instead of waiting to reach equilibrium and, and seeing those particles migrate to where their buoyant density is equal to that of the surrounding media, you're actually kind of starting with more of a race here. So all of your particles start at the top of the tube. And from there, they'll start to migrate or pellet down towards the bottom. Uh, and that's directly related to their sedimentation coefficient. And so things that are bigger and heavier and more dense will start to sediment more quickly. And so you can achieve a pretty good separation between things uh, using this technique. And it's more of a race rather than an equilibrium type experiment. Um, typical gradient materials used for this are sucrose and iodixanol. Uh, and, and again, it's used for um, separating particles that are different sizes rather than different densities. Um, all of these are quite common. It really just depends on what the use case is. So this is a relatively generic workflow for the production of advanced therapeutics. So again, things like uh, viral vectors like AAV. Um, usually you start with an upstream part of the workflow where you've got cell expansion as well as um, transfection, and then finally production of your virus itself. And then in the downstream stage of the workflow, um, that's when you start to get more into the purification, right? And, and we'll talk a lot more about that. Uh, and then finally, as, as the end point, basically it's uh, vial fill and finish to make sure you've got a, a um, adequate finalized product. But in terms of purification, we're, we're focusing on DGUC or density gradient ultra centrifugation. And so I'll talk through some of the steps of that method here. Uh, the first thing you want to do is choose a gradient material. Uh, I've already mentioned a few of those cesium chloride, sucrose, iodixanol. Those tend to be the most common options. Uh, generally, they've got pretty well defined use cases uh, in terms of when you'd want to use one over the other. Another thing you'd want to do is, is choose a gradient method. And those are all the things I've uh, talked about on the previous slide in terms of what's going to give you the best separation for your sample type. 
After you've decided those things, uh, you'll want to load and run the rotor. Uh, and so the first, first part of this is um, choosing the type of tube. Uh, so there's a variety of tubes that we offer here at Beckman. Um, in terms of tube sealing, we've got permanent seal tubes. So things like a heat seal um, for the best biocontainment. We've also got plug sealing tubes and then finally open top tubes. And I'll talk more about those uh, towards the end of the talk as well. Choosing a tube material can be important. Obviously, you want to ensure um, compatibility with your sample type. And then finally, choosing a rotor. Uh, and this is really going to be the focus of the talk today. How do you choose the right rotor? Which rotor is best for your application? That's what I'll spend the most time focusing on for this. Finally, sample recovery. Uh, there's two really common methods that are used here. Um, Simple extraction of a band is generally done by piercing the side of a tube using a syringe and a needle. Uh, and that's where you're able to visualize your band. You see exactly what it is that you want to pull out and, and you do that through the side of the tube. The other option is fractionation. Um, this can be done in a lot of different instances, but typically you pierce the bottom of the tube and in a manual sense, you, you would fractionate that and drip it into the bottom of a, a well plate. But we've got a lot of customers nowadays too that are using actas so chromatography systems to fractionate their sample here and do direct inline measurements of what's inside uh, so really some some strong options there it just depends on what you're trying to do and so this slide is uh, meant to show the different types of rotors that are offered and when you might want to use each one over some of the others so what you see there on the left is the um, the swinging bucket rotors. Uh, I mentioned this a bit already, but these are used for rate zonal type experiments where it really is a race from start to finish. So the long path length of these tubes is really advantageous in those. You can also use these for pelleting or flotation. Um, in those cases, typically you'd use this kind of rotor because the um, sample of interest that you're trying to pellet ends up being a pretty small mass. And so uh, one of the good examples of this is extracellular vesicles or exosomes where you don't end with a lot of them. And so being able to visualize is really important for this, as well as pellet stability too, making sure they stick to the bottom of the tube, but not stick, stick hard enough to um, result in damage. And so these rotors are really great for that. Uh, the angle of these rotors is 90 degrees. Uh, for those of you not familiar with swing bucket rotors, uh, as you can see in that example, um, really your, your buckets hang down to the bottom of the tube, but once it starts spinning, uh, the centrifugal force pulls those up towards a 90 degree angle and they're actually flying out there on the side. And so the path length again is quite long uh, when you're at speed. For fixed angle rotors, on the other hand, um, these have a pretty different use case. Uh, they're generally used for pelleting or flotation, but I would say more so pelleting. The angle in this case tends to be 20 to 30 degrees, and they're really great for large scale type experiments where you're pelleting a bunch of stuff and you don't have to worry about visibility of that pellet. So something like pelleting lentivirus or a protein that's been precipitated out using PEG. Our best selling rotor for that is the type 70 TI. It's got a really high speed, but also a, a pretty good volume. And the path length for this at speed is, is quite medium, as you can see there in the uh, graphic at the bottom. Uh, the next one is near vertical there in the purple. Uh, and this is where you start to get more into the isopicnic or equilibrium zonal space. Uh, and that's probably what we'll focus on most today. Um, the angle for these rotors is usually between seven and 10 degrees, so pretty close to vertical. Uh, and these are really great for density gradients, similar to vertical rotors. But the use case for these is when you tend to have um, samples which have larger amounts of contaminants. So if you, if you expect something to either pellet or float, it can be really advantageous to use this near vertical rotor. That way you don't get accumulation of that contaminant on the side of the tube. And uh, the NVT65 is the rotor I'm uh, illustrating there. And then all the way at the bottom, the, the path length for these is quite short. Um, it's, it's near vertical. Uh, and then finally, what we'll focus on today is the vertical rotors. Again, really great for the isopicnic and equilibrium zonal experiments. The, there's no angle here. These rotor, uh, these tubes rather in the rotor are perfectly vertical. And these are 
simply put, the best options for density gradient type uh, purifications where you're using isopicnic or equilibrium zonal. So the only difference there would be rate zonal. If you're, if you're doing that, you might want to use something else. But these are fantastic when the density between what you're trying to separate is, is uh, pretty small. The VTI 50.1 rotor is the example there, and I'll, I'll talk a lot more about that. And in terms of path length, very short. Um, you can compare the illustrations or the graphics at the bottom of the screen there for each of these rotors. This one very clearly has the shortest path length. So uh, I'll jump now into kind of current state and what most of our customers are doing uh, using these, these different rotors. And so the first thing that I want to talk about is fixed angled and swinging bucket rotors. Uh, these are currently the most common rotors that we have uh, for empty and full separation. So that's empty and full virus particles, typically things like AAV or adenovirus. And the, the, really the question is why are they used so much? Um, if I've been telling you this whole time that vertical rotors are the best, why are swinging bucket and fixed angle so popular? And I'll, I'll go through some examples of this. So the first reason for this is for the established literature base. Uh, and so I'm showing a graph there on the right side. And you can see in green is the SW32. It's our best selling swinging bucket rotor. And then in, in blue or cyan is our type 70. And then finally in red is our VTI 50. Um, we've actually come out with a, a better version of this rotor since, so we no longer sell this, but we chose it for this illustration because this is kind of where the established literature is at. Uh, you can see a, a pretty stark difference here, right? Um, the reason for that, I, I think, is probably because of a feedback loop. Uh, most people don't know where to start with this. And so what they end up doing is taking a look at the literature and seeing that a lot of a lot of people are using type 70 TI or type uh, or SW32 TI. And so they end up just doing the same thing because they can follow those protocols. But there's other reasons for this as well. Uh, versatility certainly is one, uh, especially as it pertains to fixed angled rotors. These are useful for all centrifuge based separations. So everything I've shared with you so far in terms of different types of methods, pelleting, isopicnic, equilibrium zonal, rate zonal, uh, really, the fixed angle can do all of them. Is it the best at all of them? No, but it can do all of them. And so if you're on a budget constraint or something like that, uh, it might be the best option for you. And again, they're, they're used in a, a, a broad range of applications as well. So extracellular vesicles, um, viral vectors, cells, everything. So there really is a, a strong um, rationale for choosing a fixed angle rotor if that's what you're trying to do. Uh, and then finally, I think is the knowledge gap. And so that's what I'm hoping to address a bit here today in terms of why vertical rotors are so good for these specific types of separations. They're not really good for anything else, but when it comes to isopicnic or equilibrium zonal separations, vertical rotors are by far the most efficient. And so that's what I'll be trying to um, uh, share with you today. So that's current state. A lot of people are using swinging bucket and fixed angle when they really should be using the vertical rotors. Uh, and to go into more detail about that, um, I'll start here. Uh, and so this slide is meant to illustrate how you might separate some similarly dense particles, right? So at the top there, I've got the swinging bucket section. And then at the bottom is the vertical rotor section. Uh, and so right now we're looking at the tubes at rest before you start spinning them at all. So before they're even put into the centrifuge. What most of our customers do is they start with a homogeneous distribution of cesium chloride or whatever their um, density gradient forming material is. Cesium chloride just tends to be the most popular for viral vectors. Uh, and so often they'll add a, a solid amount of um, cesium chloride to this tube to a defined final density. So really what I'm trying to show on the screen there is that these two different types of rotors start in the exact same point. Um, you've got this uniform distribution of density gradient material as well as your sample of interest. Where things start to differ, however, is once it starts spinning. And so starting at the top there with swinging bucket, uh, when it starts spinning, as I mentioned, these tubes will 
fly out to the side at a 90 degree angle and start spinning that way. And so your G force is, is uh, towards the right there as the arrow indicates. These cesium chloride particles or whatever your density forming material is have a very long distance to travel because that path length is so long. And so you end up with a gradient that forms quite slowly. In contrast to that, uh, the vertical rotor has a pretty short path length and uh, there's really not a very large distance for these particles to travel. And so that uh, ends up resulting in a uh, much, gr much faster gradient formation. So if we compare what happens at the end, right? Once your um, centrifuge has come back down to, to zero RPM, so at rest after spinning, uh, and I will mention here too that we have a lot of uh, customers that we've spoken with with in the past that um, don't apply any break to these experiments. Uh, and I can say we've not actually seen a difference between applying maximum break and zero break, uh, at least not a quantifiable difference. So that's a good way for you to save time if you're already implementing density gradients in your workflow, um, just apply maximum break. And I'll actually show example of that later. But the, the takeaway from this really is once the centrifuge has stopped spinning at rest, these two tubes are equal. It's just that the vertical rotor got there much quicker because of that short path length. Uh, that's not the only advantage that vertical rotors have, however. Um, they can also improve your resolution. And so that's what I'm going to share on this slide. Um, again, th the same type of layout here. We've got swing bucket at the top and, and vertical there at the bottom except now we're not starting with pre-centrifugation, we're starting with while the tube is actually spinning. And so you can actually see the, the difference there between the orientation of the tubes. But while the swinging bucket tube is spinning um, and the gradient's been formed, the density range is, is quite broad. Uh, and the main reason for this is because there's a significant change in uh, relative centrifugal force between the minimum radius and the maximum radius of this tube. And so just uh, some hypothetical numbers there could be 1.05 grams per mil on the minimum radius and 1.45 on the max radius. And if we jump down to the bottom with the vertical rotor, again, this is while spinning after the gradient's been formed, uh, the density range here, so the range from lower value to, to the highest value is, is uh, really low. So this is a very shallow gradient that's being formed here. There's very little change in density from one end of the tube to the other. Uh, and the example here is 1.3 to 1.4 grams per mil. That might not sound like much right now, but once the tube actually stops spinning, it results in a pretty significant difference. Uh, and so jumping back up to the top there with the swing bucket rotor, um, there's going to be reorientation of this entire tube uh, as the, the rotor comes to a stop. And that gradient um, is unchanged upon reorientation. So the difference in those bands in terms of their, their, their physical difference between each other is not going to change. And at the bottom, you can see what the vertical rotor looks like. So in this case, the tubes themselves are not changing. They're spinning at zero degrees, right? But you end up getting a reorientation of the gradient itself. And the tube shape um, that we have here uh, really facilitates a smooth orientation of that. And you actually end up getting an expansion of those bands upon reorientation. And so really um, higher resolution is available um, using these vertical rotors especially when you're separating particles that differ, uh, in, in, differ in terms of density on a, on a pretty small scale. So things like partial and full capsids for viral vectors, for example. So um, looking in more detail about some of these rotors, uh, and these are the most common ones. Uh, I've already talked about each of these a little bit. But in terms of volume, uh, the VTI 50.1 is the newest rotor that we've commercialized, and it's got uh, a larger volume than any of the other ones that I've talked about so far today. There's actually 12 by 39 mil capacity for a total of nearly 500 mils. And if you look at how long it will take you for an isopicnic separation in each of these rotors, um, that's laid out there in the bottom of that table, where VTI 50.1 uh, is very clearly the fastest, and it also provides the best resolution. Uh, and so you can really form these gradients faster. 
get a higher resolution. And uh, in addition to that, these this new rotor uh, uses basically all of the same uh, consumables, tubes, adapters, everything that that um, the rest of the rotors use. Uh, so now I can jump into some of these case studies uh, where we actually provide some examples and specifics to illustrate some of these things that I've talked about so far. Uh, and so this first one here uh, was done using that VTI 50.1 rotor that I've talked a lot about. Um, and what we start with there in the top left is a uniform distribution of our sample, which in this case is adenovirus serotype 5, as well as um, cesium chloride. Uh, and this was done at a defined starting density of 1.35 grams per mil. Uh, that should be pretty close to the buoyant density of adenovirus. We ramp this up as quickly as possible uh, in the XPN, um, the Optima XPN centrifuge. And we did this exact same separation in a handful of different rotors. So starting at the top, we've got the swinging bucket in the middle of the fixed angle. And then at the bottom, the VTI 50.1 or the vertical rotor which we ran at two speeds. We then applied a maximum break to this, as I mentioned before, and we measured the position of each of these bands and quantified them using DLS. Uh, and then in those um, images that you can see there at the bottom, uh, so the um, fixed angle is the farthest on the left there, you see two distinct bands. And then farthest on the right is the swinging bucket rotor where you again see two distinct bands what I really want to point out here is that when we did these separations in the vertical rotor, we actually ended up seeing three distinct bands for each of them. Uh, and so emergence of a third band is possible. Uh, again, that's because of the higher resolution that is, is uh, achievable using these types of rotors. So um, really a strong use case here for vertical rotors when it comes to isopicnic gradients. Now, jumping to the next one here, um, this is really meant to not, instead of illustrating the resolution, illustrate the, um, the time that it takes to get to equilibrium with these rotors. So same type of layout as the previous slide, but instead uh, there on the top left, we're not starting with a homogeneous concentration. So we did play a, a bit of a trick here where we're starting with layers. So we've got one layer at the bottom, which is a high density cesium chloride solution. And then at the top is our sample. And we threw that in the VTI 90 rotor uh, and did the exact same process as before where we tried out a handful of different um, uh, uh, run speeds and, and times, then applied a maximum break. And from there it recovered the sample or fractionated the tube. Uh, and this was done via manual fractionation. And if you look at that graph there at the bottom, you can see uh, this is the equilibrium scenario. So this is what a lot of customers have approached us about. You're running this thing for a long time, often overnight for 16 hours. Um, and you can see the, the gradient there um, in, in those gray dots. So uh, really, you can, you can take a look at the uh, range of that gradient as well as the profile. But when we start to implement some multi-speed runs, so starting it at a very high high speed and dropping it down or, or um, adjusting those times as much as we can, uh, you can see that in this case here with the blue, uh, the blue dots there now, 30 minutes at 90K and then an hour at 60K, we get pretty close to where we were with the 16 hour time point. Now, speed of a rotor is directly correlated to the resolution that you observe. So higher speeds tend to favor better sensitivity while lower speeds favor better resolution. And so in this case, um, you can see that there's quite a bit of difference. Uh, it's, it's close, but it's not exactly where we'd want it to be to get that exact, uh, exact same gradient profile. So we tried another run here um, there in red, where we ran for 50 minutes at 90K and 30 minutes at 60K. Uh, and we see there that it, it's quite similar to what we saw with the 16 hour run at 60K. So starting at a really high speed and then dropping it down can allow you to form these gradients faster. And in this particular case, we were able to form that continuous gradient in just 80 minutes using this uh, VTI 90 rotor. So now I'll jump into some of the key takeaways from uh, the presentation today. 
So starting here with um, the instrument and some of the tubes that are offered. Uh, so our flagship instrument here is the Optima XPN, which is uh, GMP supporting. Uh, and we've got a ton of tubes that are available for a variety of different rotors. Um, these are just five of the many options that we've got. Uh, at the smaller scale, two mil tubes, which we've seen a lot of customers implement very successfully for uh, sort of process development and scaling up. And then on that larger scale, once you've developed a process, up to the 39 mil tubes, which is what our VTI 50.1 rotor uses. Um, we've also got a fixed angle rotor that uses 100 mil tubes. Uh, and then in terms of tube format, so quick seal is probably the most common thing that we've got, especially for the highest biocontainment. Uh, on the left there is polypropylene, which is really um, broadly compatible with a variety of different materials. And then on the right side, they're ultra clear. And so you can see an example of uh, the visibility that's offered by these types of tubes. Uh, we also sell OptiSeal tubes, um, and these are plug seal. Uh, so much simpler than what you get with the quick seal, um, not quite as high of biocontainment, but really ideal for fast, simple ultra workflows, especially at that, that um, R&D type scale and environment. Um, we also offer open top tubes, but obviously those, those won't work uh, in a vertical rotor. And in terms of the rotors themselves, um, these are the four that we've got uh, available today. I've talked a little bit about the VTI-90 and, and uh, how quickly you can form a continuous gradient in that. Uh, and this is uh, using those smaller scale tubes. In the middle there with the 65.2 and 65.1, we've got um, a, a pretty good balance between speed and uh, number of samples or throughput. And then finally, uh, all the way on the right, there's the VTI-50.1, which is the um, largest capacity vertical rotor on the market. So to wrap things up here, um, I'll go through some of these conclusions. So density gradients are, are typically chosen when you've got a relatively difficult separation. Um, in other words, there's a very subtle difference between what you're trying to separate out and what you're trying to purify. Uh, and also because of high purity and high yield. So some examples of this are, are viral vectors, plasmids, extracellular vesicles. Um, and then within that DGUC realm, uh, rate zonal runs are, which are a separation based on size and mass or sedimentation coefficient, are best suited for swinging bucket rotors. And then isopicnic or equilibrium zonal runs, um, in other words, a separation basis uh, on the basis of buoyant density, uh, is done using vertical rotors. So to go over some of the benefits of these vertical rotors, um, first of all, it's high purity. I talked about the shallow density gradients that are formed because there's a pretty minimal shift in um, centrifugal force between the inner and outer radius of the tubes. So those offer the highest resolution. In terms of yield, these particles really are getting compressed into these, these very um, discrete tight bands. And so very often it's very easy, easy to visualize these and precisely extract them from the tube. Run times are shorter in these uh, vertical rotors as well because you can achieve equilibrium faster. In terms of capacity, I already mentioned the 50.1 is the highest capacity vertical rotor on the market. And then finally with DGUC as a whole, uh, these techniques are serotype independent, right? All three of the ones I've discussed today uh, so each tube in a single run could be a different sample or a different serotype. Uh, and the highest uh, different sample type rotor that we've got is for 16. So really great in an R&D environment as well as in uh, larger scale workflows as well. And then finally, um, I've also mentioned how these cesium chloride density gradients can be produced in 80 minutes using the smaller scale VTI-90 rotor. It's really fantastic for um, sort of building out your process at that smaller scale and not using quite as much sample to do it. Uh, and then scaling up from there is, is quite simple as the process remains the same. Um, the only thing that has to be accounted for is slightly different speeds and dimensions in uh, the tubes that you're using. So with that, I'd like to um, thank, thank everyone for your attention today.
And uh, just briefly mention that uh, we've got a lot of additional content that's available on vertical rotors, as well as density gradient ultra centrifugation at, at large. Uh, so I'm just sharing some of these here, but if you go to our website, we can uh, you can access a lot more of those. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, for your informative presentation. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, what purification scale is possible with density gradients? How much time do the vertical rotors save? Uh, thank you. That's a, that's a great question and, and one that we get quite often. Uh, really, it, it comes down to what you're trying to purify and, and what your workflow looks like. Um, I tend to always default to viral vectors. That's what I hear most people working on these days. Um, and so we've got these vertical rotors implemented in um, R&D workflows. And I, I've already talked a little bit about um, how the serotype independent nature of these techniques is an advantage there. Um, you know, every every hole in the rotor can be something different. Uh, but then to your question, all the way to PD and manufacturing, um, 50 liter bioreactors are commonly purified in a single run. Um, but we've also got a lot of customers that have really strong concentration steps prior to centrifugation. So typically this is done using TFF or tangential flow filtration um, or on, on the smaller scale, if, if you've got a need for that, centrifugal spin filters work quite well. And so with that, concentration step, um, we've got customers that are able to do 200 liter reactors uh, in a single rotor, especially with the, the higher volume one. Um, and then the, the second part of that question is as far as time savings goes, again, it's somewhat case, uh, case by case. Um, but I, as I mentioned before, many of our customers are running these DGUC experiments overnight. So 16 to 22 hours uh, for cesium chloride tends to be uh, pretty common. Um, but what that tells me is that there's a lot of room for optimization and, and time savings in many of these cases. Uh, I shared the example for uh, the, the case study there with, with CBM, uh, where we saw really strong purification and, and separation between those species in, in uh, six to nine hours. Uh, and then on the smaller scale, um, that VTI-90 rotor can form a gradient and a linear gradient in 80 minutes. So there really is a big potential for time savings in most cases by switching to these rotors, um, but uh, speed has to be accounted for as well. Great, thank you. Uh, my next question, do you have any tips for recovering sample after DGUC? Yeah, this tends to be one of the pain points in the process. Um, I don't think anyone really loves the way things are currently done. Um, one thing that's often overlooked, I think, is uh, the lab setup and the layout. Uh, that, that can be really crucial for this. Uh, so what I mean by that is setting the centrifuge as close as possible to the hood or, or where you're actually doing the work in terms of extracting your sample from it. You want to make sure you're not moving these tubes around too much after the gradient has been formed. Um, two common methods for this are, as I mentioned, extraction and fractionation. Uh, so extraction is just using a syringe and a needle to actually pluck out the, the, the band that you see there. Um, and one of the things that helps a lot with that is for, uh, is putting a light underneath the tube. So there's some flat kind of lights that we use. I think I purchased them on Amazon for our lab, uh, and those can slide right underneath pretty well and illuminate things and allow you to see it, uh, see the band quite a bit better. Uh, and then in terms of um, material, so we offer polypropylene and ultra clear. Polypropylene is is very compatible with with most solutions, and ultra clear tends to provide higher visibility. But I think in terms of piercing the tube itself, uh, polypropylene is is a little bit easier to do. Uh, and then also I I briefly mentioned this, but um, fractionation using a chromatography system is becoming more and more popular. Uh, as kind of an automated approach to to actually doing this. Thank you. Um, do you have any recommendations or suggestions for separating precursor phage um, capsids that have different amounts of protein that can be unex um, unexpanded, semi-expanded, and fully expanded, um, and no DNA using the vertical rotors? 
Oh, that's an interesting application. Um, it sounds like there would be some discrete differences in density between each of those um, different species. So I would assume a density gradient uh, probably linear, given that there's a lot of um, different subpopulations there, um, would work quite well for this. Um, and obviously, as I said, the vertical rotors tend to be the best for these types of, of purifications. Uh, in terms of recommendations, I'd have to try to understand your workflow a bit better. Um, but perhaps that's something we can chat about um, offline. I can I can follow up with you. Great. Um, in the first case study, why is there only one lower band visible with the fifty point two? Uh, yeah. So that's the the fifty point two is the fixed angle rotor that we used in there, um, and the thought there is that it just simply hasn't reached equilibrium yet. Um, you know the sample was exactly the same going into all of those tubes and rotors. Uh, so really, I think it's just that the material that makes up that band has not been compressed into a tight band yet. Um, and that's probably due to the longer path length um, that those fixed angled rotors have compared to the vertical. Great, thank you. Um, our next question, what kind of throughput is possible using DGUC? Uh, this is another common question we get to. Um, a bit of a tricky one, but I'm assuming you're meaning a uh, number of samples here. So of the vertical rotor options that we have, uh, the VTI uh, 65.2 is the most samples. So you can run up to 16 samples at once um, and it won't be able to purify quite as fast as the VTI 90 in, in terms of I'm thinking in terms of throughput here. Um, but I would assume within a few hours, you'd, you'd be good to go if you have an optimi optimized method using that rotor. Great. Um, our next question, is gradient reorientation a problem in vertical rotors? Wouldn't swinging bucket be better? Um, not really. Uh, the, the tubes that we have are, are designed to allow for that smooth reorientation. Uh, and going back again to that, that first case study, it, it might have been a bit hard to see in the images, um, but that was illustrated kind of in there where we've got um, Vis visible bands looking exactly the same in both of the rotors, so swing bucket or vertical. So reorientation doesn't seem to really play a role there in terms of what the output actually is. Uh, and then also the, the max break thing too. I, I do want to point that out one more time because it's often surprising when I talk to people about this, but that study was done using uh, applying maximum break. So no coasting at all um, uh, for everything. So really a I don't think there's a need to have that extra long step there at the end in most cases. Great. Our next question. My ultra doesn't have the option of doing a multi-speed protocol. Why? So for the Beckman um, floor models, uh, we've got two that we that we sell, and, and those are the XE and the XPN. Um, the XE tends to be a little bit cheaper, um, but the XPN has that multi-speed option along with some other improved software features, including kind of a smart software as well as uh, more of the GMP supporting. So it, it's probably that you have the, the XE rather than the XPN. And it looks like we have one more question here. Can you elaborate on braking and coasting to stop the run? Yeah, um, coasting has always been the traditional approach, I think, for this. Um, and depending on the speed that you're running at and the type of rotor that you use, uh, it can take over an hour sometimes. Uh, and on our instruments, um, I think there's either nine or 10 different um, options to choose from in terms of, so on a zero to nine scale, zero might be com coasting completely, no brake applied whatsoever. So coming down from say 90,000 RPM uh, can take a really long time there. Uh, and then on the the, the other end of that scale, a nine being maximum break, which usually stops in just a few minutes. Um, however, we've we've not seen any real data illustrating, you know, why that coasting step is needed, um, nor have we in our own hands seen any quantifiable difference between coasting or, or applying max break. Uh, so my recommendation to people is is to to go with a maximum break, um, and you know that that slide that I shared for the CBM study, which is kind of an application brief that we have available online. Um, that was all max break too. So um, yeah, that's my thoughts on it. 
Great, thank you so much. That looks like it brings us to the end of our Q&A portion. Um, do you have any final co um, comments for our audience? Oh, I'll just say that um, if anyone wants to follow up with me, um, I can definitely get your information from LabRoots and, and have a chat. We're always looking for opportunities to um, you know, learn more about customer workflows and, and provide some of this guidance in terms of how to optimize, implement or optimize DGUC. And then also we're, we're always open for collaborations as well. Um, and a lot of the stuff that I presented today was, was done um, using collaborations. So thank you. Yeah, thank you again, Sean, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Beckman Coulter, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.